Welcome. My name is Veronica Santiago Lu. Uh, thank you so much for attending this virtual event organized by Word Up Community Bookshop. Word Up is a bookshop, an art space run by local residents, uh, many of whom are volunteers. Uh, we started as a one month long pop up shop in 2011 and stuck around due to overwhelming community demand. Uh, so this June we'll be celebrating our 12th birthday. We can be found at 2113 Amsterdam Avenue at the corner of 165th Street in Washington Heights, New York City. We host events for all ages and sell used and new books in English and Spanish. You can check out wordupbooks.com to shop and see our other uh, virtual and outdoor events we have and increasingly indoor events. Uh, we're open Tuesdays 12 to 8 p.m. and Wednesday to Saturday 12 to 6 p.m. We also have a new alternate location called Recirculation at the corner of 160th and Riverside Drive. This space came about because a former Word Up collective member passed away from COVID and left us in charge of all of his books and records, which we've been recirculating um, as pay what you can books and records. Uh, so I hope you'll visit us soon and thank you for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to welcome Jasmine Mendez, um, who has done a few events with Word Up, and all of them have been um, real hits. So I hope that you pick up her other books as well. Um, Jasmine is a best selling Dominican American poet, educator, translator, playwright, and award winning author of several books for children and adults. She's had poetry and essays published in numerous journals and anthologies, and she's the author of two multi genre collections, including Island of Dreams, which won an International Latino Book Award. Her debut poetry collection, City Without Altar, was a finalist for the Noemi Pre po Press Poetry Prize and was released last August. Um, and I think there should be a video up on our YouTube um, from an event uh, last fall. And her debut picture book, Josefina's Habichuelas, uh, was the Writer League, uh, Writer's League of Texas Children's Book Discovery Prize winner. Um, also previously at Word Up, Jasmine's presented uh, personal essays and poems with Night Blooming Jasmine a few years ago um, in, in the before times pre-pandemic. <laughs> um, she's also translated the work of New York Times bestselling authors Amanda Gorman, Nicole Hannah-Jones, Renee Watson, and Clarabelle Ortega. Um, she's, the, uh, she's an MFA graduate of the Creative Writing Program at the Rainier Writing Workshop at Pacific Lutheran University and a University of Houston alumni. She's the program director for the literary arts nonprofit Dintero Projects, and she lives and works in Houston, Texas. So today we'll be celebrating her book, Aniana Del Mar Jumps In. Um, and in conversation with Jasmine will be Angela Abreu. Um, Angela Breu is the founder of Dominican Writers Association um, and a long, long time partner of Word Up Community Bookshop um, and all of the iterations before Dominican Writers and before Word Up Community Bookshop existed. Um, she's also a neighbor um, and there's been a lot of um, things that Dominican Writers has done and I'll, but I'll let you I'll let Angie share what all those things are um, in conversation with uh, Jasmine. And we'll also hear reading and uh, there'll be a Q&A afterwards. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you everyone for being here with us tonight. We're so excited to be here. Um, happy book birthday to Aniana Del Mar jumps in. Congratulations, Jasmine. I am always in awe with how much work you do during the year i and i you're one of those authors that i lose count on the amount of books that you put out you and adriana herrera like i have to i don't know i don't i don't know how to keep up with you both and not only that you don't just write children's book you also write poetry and memoir and you're a playwright and there's just so many spaces that you're tapping into which i find inspiring and whenever a dominican writer approaches me i'm like you could do this jasmine does it <laughs> jasmine has tried it all so she's she you could definitely do it so thank you for being such an inspiring dominican writer um and welcome thank thank you for requesting this conversation with us tonight Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm doing all the things, um, but it's because I love it and I have so many stories to tell. And so um, I apologize if I'm a little echoey. This room is, doesn't have a lot of <laughs> a lot of things in it, so it's a little echoey. But um, but yeah, I'm excited. Of course, I wanted to be in conversation and, and have Dominican writers 
Association and you as a part of this launch and a part of this book, because um, you are all things, you know, Dominican. And so and Aniana is also all things <laughs> Dominican. There's water and platanos and, you know, a little merengue. So, <laughs> so I had to include you all. And, um, and thank you for, for hosting me yet again. Always, always. Um, I wanted to share something that folks probably are not aware of about Aniana, and it's where her name came from. Mm -hmm. Right. So Aniana is a 12 year old Dominican American swimmer. She's diagnosed with juvenile. Correct me if I'm wrong. Idiopathic arthritis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Correct. <laughs> the name Aniana comes from Aniana Vargas, a Dominican revolutionary and environmentalist better known as the mother of the waters, which I had no idea mm -hmm. this person existed. So thank yeah. you for that education. She was an anti Trujillo political activist and a defender of environmental conversa conversation. Her best friend, Maria Tere, in the book, um, is also named after an anti Trujillo activist, um, Maria Teresa of the Mineral Sister. That is so wonderful that you incorporate the, these, um, you know, very important political figures into. Mm -hmm. Um, our Dominican books. And it's one of the things that I appreciate whenever I read our books, because we're also learning. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of our writers do very extensive research and to be able to incorporate them into their, uh, into their work, even if it is fiction, there's always some um, facts sprinkled throughout the book. Yeah. Um, go on. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I'm, I have a very particular thing with names and making sure that, that names carry meaning. Um, and so in thinking about this book, what I was going to name this character, um, yeah, I did my own research. And also at the time, I was like knee deep in my other book, City Without Altar, which is all about, you know, the Trujillo era and all of that. And so, um, so yeah, I kind of actually came across Aniana Vargas, there was like a posting on Women's Month, I think like two years ago, um, that listed some some inspirational like Dominican American women or Dominican women um, revolutionaries. And I saw her name and I was like, oh, this is interesting. And I did some more research and I knew that in wanting to talk about Aniana and the water and, and sort of this environment, there was a, a slight uh, more environmentalist sort of aspect in the earlier drafts of the book. And I thought Aniana is the perfect name and it's sort of not a typical name, um, but it, I felt like it encompassed, um, yeah, her personality. It gave, it gave her name and her history kind of a nice backstory. Um, and I love nicknames. I know Dominicans love nicknames. So I was like, you can't say Aniana, you can say Ani. So she's Ani throughout the whole book, you know? <laughs> so, you know, we definitely gave her a nickname. <laughs> gave her a nickname. So. <laughs> and same thing with Maria Teresa. I kind of wanted to put in a little bit of of history there with the Mirabal sisters and um, and hopefully kind of, you know, subversively excite people to learn a little bit more about Dominican history, which is something that I didn't have growing up at all. All Dominican history I've learned has been as an adult in my 20s and 30s. And so I'm just, I'm hopeful that that little seed will spark more research and conversations. Yeah, so we appreciate you doing that. <laughs> um, could you share a little bit of, of the book with us and do a short reading? For sure, yes, would love to. All right, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna start kind of near the beginning. I don't give away too many spoilers, but just sort of set up um, the book and the setting for you all. So it's set in Galveston, um, which some people have feelings about. I have learned <laughs> they're like, oh, Galveston. Because so for y'all on the East Coast, Galveston is kind of like our Long Island, where you go, but maybe you don't get in the water. Um, but I do. Um, so, and so does Aniana. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of similar things, I think, to, 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 to Long Island in that sense, you know, we even have what's called Pleasure Pier, and it's kind of like where the Ferris wheel and all these games and things are at and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to, um, I'm going to read a little bit about the setting, um, and maybe do a shape poem with you all. So this is from the, the first section. My island. We live on an island. The island where we live is an outstretched arm reaching into the Gulf of Mexico. Galveston, where the streets are lined with papel picado houses in peacock green and pomegranate pink. Hundreds of shotgun houses where the wind whistles in through the front door and shoots directly down the hallways out the back. Hundreds of houses in sherbet colors that remind mommy of back home. But this is the only home I've ever known. On Sundays before church, I like to walk to the seawall. Sorry, I went out. Mm -mm. 
alone and watch the sunrise explode in the sky like cascarones on Easter. Blue, pink, and orange colors confetti the horizon and kiss the sea. Sometimes I don't know if the ocean is the sky or the sky is the ocean. It opens big, wide, endless, the way I do when I swim. Sometimes I think that if I swim long enough, I'll reach that cascaron sky. And instead of swimming, I'll begin to soar. Um, and then in contrast a little bit, I'm gonna try to turn the slide back on. Give me one second. Nope, it does not like me. So I apologize for that. Um, so there's a poem there about her island. Um, and then there's a poem about Mommy's Island. So I'll read that next. Mommy's Island. When Mommy isn't busy reading her Bible or stockpiling cans and supplies for hurricane season or banging pots and pans in the kitchen and cooking, she joins us under the orange tree. She sits Mappy on her lap, peels us oranges and tell us stories about back home. When Mommy says back home, she means her island the other island in the middle of the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean, the island she and Poppy call Isqueya. Isqueya is an island of coconuts, white sand beaches, baseball, and bachata. It is an island where Spanish sounds like a saxophone cut off before the end of a song. Isqueya, Isqueya, Isqueya. Mommy licks her fingers and closes her eyes, as if the word and the sweet tartness of the orange take her back to some other time and place. Isqueya, Isqueya, Isqueya. She smiles, a smile of a thousand suns whenever she says it. I giggle because I think Isqueya sounds like cosquillas. Isqueya, Isqueya, Isqueya. When I say it, it sounds like a secret that tickles the roof of my mouth. And so, I smile too. Back home, mommy. Back home, the sun is hotter than it is here. It burns the scalp if you're not careful. Back home, the ocean is teal and turquoise, not brown and muddy like here. Back home, I'm surrounded by family and music and bochinche all the time. Back home, I taught my Mateo, mi hermanito, how to protect himself. Mati licks his arm dripping with orange juice and asks, how would you protect him, mommy? Mommy, we would run in the streets barefoot, but I taught him how to watch for glass and rocks. We would ride motoconchos, little motorcycles that could fit six or 10 people in one seat. And I would make Mateo ride in the middle like a piece of lunch meat wedged between our cousins and me. I wouldn't let him swim in the river or the sea because his lungs weren't strong enough. So instead, I'd let him watch me. I used to love the water just as much as you do, Ani. But then, Mommy sighs, strokes my hair, and hugs Mati closer. The hurricane came, and I learned I couldn't protect my Mateo from everything. Mommy's voice cuts off like a phone call with bad reception, and I know the conversation is over. Because when Mommy mentions Mateo, the tears always fall before she's finished her story. Um, okay, I'm gonna read just a couple more um, and then I'll share a shape poem. So I'll be sharing my screen in just a moment. I apologize it got dark in here. This is not my, um, not my office. So, um, all right, tourists. In Texas, May marks the unofficial beginning of summer, which means college students and tourists from other Texas towns crowd the beach and take up too much space on the seawall and in the streets. The tourists love to dump trash and talk trash while, loun while lounging on the sandy beaches of my island. Galveston, they say, and wrinkle their noses as if g -g -g gagging on the gallons of gray smoke that fill the sky nearby. They edge near the water as if afraid to get in. They're disappointed they're not mere blue-green waters like the ones they might find on Mommy's Island. Galveston's water looks brown because the Mississippi River empties itself into the Gulf and all the mud settles here. But the tourists don't care about the truth. 
they, uh, they just complain and criticize. Oh my God, the water is so gross. They moan and groan. They tiptoe into an ocean wave and leave more than just footprints behind in the sand. Goddess, I don't care what they say. I love my island. I think Galveston is a gallant Greek goddess who holds history inside her sea-walled feet and palm tree hands. I know she is strong because she is able to survive storm surges and seasickness year after year after year. And then finally, I'm going to do a quick screen share because I have to share a shape poem so you get the full experience of the book. If you haven't bought it yet, I hope this convinces you. Um, and hopefully you all can see that. Maybe it's a little oh, small. Look at that. It looks like a turtle. Yes, there are several shape poems in the book. And this one is in the shape of um, a sea turtle and it's titled Turtle Shell. Mommy tells me about her Mateo. She says she and Mateo were like a sea turtle, different parts of the same person. Mateo was a soft, squishy center that needed protecting and she was supposed to be his shell. Mateo, she says, was born with water in his lungs because, she says, grandma had too much water in her womb when she pushed him out into the world. And so for the rest of his short life, he always found it harder to breathe. So mommy used her lungs for them both. She would run races and Mateo would watch. Mateo would skip rocks in the river and she would fish them out. Mommy would jump and catch fireflies with her hands and Mateo would save them in a jar. Mommy and Mateo were different parts of the same person. But when Mateo died, Mommy became an empty turtle shell crowded with a darkness that no light or love could ever fix or fill ever again. And wow. I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you. We have a few folks here who were really enjoying the reading, um, <laughs> the imagery, the sounds, the rhythm um, of everything you share, where the Spanish sounds like, like a saxophone. Um, Judy says she loves the connection between Aliana's island and her, and her mommy's island. And the oh, verse okay. of Mateo was so powerful. Um, Thank you. Everyone is truly in love with the shape poem. I've never seen anything like that, but you know. <laughs> We, we love to see it. And folks who are saying, we're, we're convinced we're buying the book now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Lupe, hi, Lupe. Lupe of course, he's putting in fun facts about Galveston. Yes, I see that. that. <laughs> the Wall Street of the South, the first it city was. of the Mason-Dixie line to use the trolley, use yep. of the telegram, and where the American Red Cross began. Thank you, yes. Lupe. Thank yes. you for that info. <laughs> Yes, it was. Galveston was supposed to be the, the Wall Street of the South until the 1900 storm came and wiped out most of the island. My in-laws house and where my husband and I got married actually is one of, or one of the few places of, like you'll see a placard outside the house. It's their historic uh, homes and venues because they survived the 1900 storm when most of the island was completely um, wiped out because of that storm. So, wow. yeah. Wow. So Jasmine, in your author's note, you talk about being deliberate about the names of the main characters in your book, like you mentioned earlier. Can you talk, um, can you talk about, you mentioned the inspiration of Aniana. Was there anyone, any other character within the book that, um, who, whose name came about because you were inspired by someone in real life? In real life? Um... No, I mean, there's, it's mentioned like once, um, Patti is her mom's name. And that actually alludes to Patricia, um, uh, Patria, sorry, Patria Mirabal, another one of the <laughs> Mirabal sisters, but it's sort of not explicit. And since her name only comes up as a sort of as a nickname, uh, occasionally here and there when um, Aniana's father says it, um, I didn't kind of put it in there necessarily, um, but it was inspired by Patria Mirabal, which is another one of the sisters. Now we know you paid homage yeah. to her as well. I did. Um, I did. So other than the names, you also talk, speak about specific settings because Texas mm -hmm. holds a special place in your heart. It is the reason why you chose to have the book set in Galveston. Um, can you talk more about that? 
Yes. Um, I'm not from Galveston, but I got married there. Uh, my in-laws live, live there um, and they hold a very special place in my heart. They're definitely my second parents. Um, I've, I've always had a, a lovely, wonderful relationship with them. Um, and actually during the pandemic, uh, my mother-in-law passed away from COVID. And so I think part of the ways in which I dealt with that grief was just pouring the story out onto the page and using Galveston as, as the setting kind of as a love letter to her um, because she lived there most of her adult life um, and she had had a special place in her heart. Um, and anytime, you know, I she really always made me feel like Galveston and her home was my home. Like I really was a daughter to her even before I got married. She was always um, super just warm and, and loving towards me. And so being from Texas and knowing that I wanted to set this book somewhere near water, I immediately thought of Galveston um, and just my connection to, to that island and really thinking about, right, the ways in which um, Galveston and the DR hold a lot of similarities because A, they're islands, they both experience a lot of uh, hurricanes and natural sort of disasters and things that throughout the years, throughout centuries even, um, they've experienced a lot of, a lot of loss um, and things like that related to, to hurricanes and water and everything. And so I wanted to draw sort of those parallels between the DR and Galveston, um, as well as, right, sort of Aniana's going through her own internal hurricane and storm, right? There's that metaphor of the hurricanes that exist in her life, um, in her body, with her, the relationship between her and her mother. That's another storm that brews, you know, and, and has its, <laughs> its sort of climactic moment as well. Um, and so it really felt like the setting is a character, right, is a part of the character that, that sort of lives and breathes and has its own life. Um, because of, right, this water and because of the hurricanes, even though in the book there's no actual hurricane that occurs, I did also create the setting a little bit right before hurricane um, season, and then the bulk of the book happens during hurricane season, which is June through November, and so then we have sort of this little bit of aftermath, kind of like the tying up of the loose ends, you know, December, November, December, um, but the majority of the like sort of tense um, you know, uh, climactic moments happen during hurricane season, June through, through November. Um, and so that was very purposeful, very intentional. Um, yeah. We had some, we've had some drastic, um, hurricane seasons in DR. <laughs> um, so the book also touches on a lot of topics. You touch on generational trauma, on religion and spirituality, on chronic illness and disability, and the mother and daughter relationship that you just mentioned. Were there any topics that were harder to write than others? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I write a lot about chronic illness and disability just in, in my other in my other works, in my in my own memoir and in my own poetry. Um, so that felt in a way more natural, um, but it was sometimes difficult because I was dealing with an, with an illness that I don't personally have. So I wanted to be sure to get it right. I didn't want to just assume that all the symptoms were the same or that what I had lived was exactly the same as what someone with JIA would experience. And so I did talk to folks you know, who live with JIA and, and I did a, try to do a lot of research in that regard to make sure that I was depicting it as authentically as possible while also knowing that these kinds of illnesses affect different people in different ways. So I'm not trying to say like, this is the one way that, you know, an individual will experience juvenile idiopathic arthritis, um, but these are some of the things that, that could happen. Um, so that was kind of a little bit of a challenge, just making sure that I had sort of a, an accurate portrayal um, of that experience. I think um, even though I wasn't intentionally, I think trying to write a mother-daughter sort of story again that's where that's kind of where it went um and so I think in um this being sort of my first real foray into like a full fiction book like at, of this length um there was it was challenging for me just to kind of learn the elements of plot and that I can't just say like oh and then happily ever after we're done like my editor was like um let's tease this out a little bit like let's let's dig into this a little more um and trying to find new ways to to approach, right? How, how does, how can this mother-daughter relationship heal or, or begin that healing process um, in a way that, that feels like, again, authentic. Um, and that maybe kind of shows us the way that it could be that dismantles the ways in which like grew up, right? Like, oh, we just don't talk about it. We'll, we'll all get over it and move on to the next thing, right? Like, and, and then it's fine. It's like, no, that we can actually, I can create a mother-daughter relationship where they, where they talk things out, where they go to therapy, where they, kind of actually heal and begin to grow in their relationship 
um, and not just wait until, you know, Ani goes yeah, off to college. Not just make them your yes. typical Dominican family. Dominican, family. Typical Dominican family. It's swept under the rug. <laughs> exactly. If we don't see it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> there Man, were some of those yeah. moments, though. There were some of those moments. Because, uh, you know, uh, in the book, Ani also has a madrina. And, and sometimes, right, we have our tias or our madrinas that are the women or the people we can talk to the, the in ways that maybe we can't talk to our mothers, right, um, at times. And so Ani does have that other adult female relationship in her life. Um, and I think I know one of the questions throughout the process um, that my editor Nancy had was like, oh, well, wouldn't mommy have something to say about madrina sort of like having this comment or saying this thing about Ani? And I was like, no, because that's Dominicans. And we talk about each other's children, whether we're related or not. And so it's just like, Anyone who knows you can tell you what to do with your child, and you just have to be like, ah, oh, I'll see. Yeah, okay, Ex bien. explaining those nuances, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, trust this happens. This, this happens. This. Across, like, you know, uh, normally we don't give unsolicited advice about parenting, but Dominicans do. So, <laughs> right, right. So, <laughs> do you have any sensitivity readers when it came to um, this disability? Yes, I, I had. I had a couple um, sensitivity readers. Um, and they're, they're mentioned in the back of the book. One was an actual um, young adult. He, he was a teenager who was also a swimmer. Um, and he read and, and actually gave really great feedback and said that it was nice to see um, a character portray his illness in that way. Um, and there were some moments, right? Because I think we all have sort of sometimes those, we're just unaware, right? We have ableist language that is unfortunately just kind of a part of our language um, and able, just, you know, the way that we speak or the way that we think and ableist ideas. And so it was nice to have an outsider or someone else look at it and say, maybe think about this or tease this moment out. Um, in particular, I think about um, Ani kind of being portrayed as, as this hero um, because she's, you know, sort of doing this brave thing because she's ill and it's like, let's not kind of perpetuate that, that sort of, um, that sort of idea and find ways that we can make it more nuanced um, and say that, you know, she's, she's living with this illness, but that doesn't necessarily make her a hero. She's, she's here. She's, she can be a hero for other reasons as well. Right. Um, and just, and so, so that was nice. It was good and important for me to have those sensitivity readers to, to, to find those moments that maybe I missed. Cause sometimes you're so close to a story right. that you just don't see things. Right. Um, and so it's good to have other folks um, kind of take a look. Right. So you are known to be very open on social media about your your own personal challenges with your disability. Um, and anyone would have assumed that this book would have been about your disability. Is there a reason why you chose a disability unknown to you rather than the one that's close to home? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I have I've been diagnosed with several multiple uh, chronic illnesses, but predominantly lupus and scleroderma. And so the reason um, that I didn't diagnose or, or give those illnesses um, to Aniana was because the ways in which, in particular, scleroderma um, manifest in young children and in young adults is actually quite different than the way that it even affects, like how it affected me as an adult. Um, usually it's localized to one part of the body. Um, it makes movement um, and just life in general. It's, it's a very disabling illness when it affects younger children most of the time, not, at, not, every, not in every case. Um, and actually, you know, swimming and being in the water might probably wasn't the best <laughs> uh, choice, right? It isn't the best kind of therapy necessarily always for a, for a young person with scleroderma. Um, and lupus typically doesn't affect young uh, adults. Um, it can affect a small group of, of children when that, that are born with it um, because the, they get it from the mother. It's, it's passed on from the mother. Um, but typically lupus affects um, childbearing age women between the ages of 18 and 35. Um, so thinking about the age range of like what kind of autoimmune disease or illness might particularly more likely affect a young person, juvenile arthritis was the one that came up and that I was drawn to because again, I looked at the list of symptoms and I was like, I've experienced this and the other chronic fatigue and the joint pain and the swelling and the low grade fevers and the rashes and the skin, you know, manifestations and things like that. And I was like, oh, 90% of these symptoms that JA, you know, patients experience I have experienced living with lupus and scleroderma as an adult. And so that was my rationale um, thinking and also thinking, right, there's, um, it, it's a little bit more of a common illness in, in young people than scleroderma or, or lupus, right? And so I thought it'd be something that, that younger folks who have this illness probably maybe have never seen themselves represented in a book. Right. Um, and that was, that was my rationale, yeah. Thank you. And also it's not very common for Dominicans to speak about 
chronic illness or disability in books. I think you're the second <laughs> author that I know that has done that. Um, recently, I went to a book release of a, um, a mom who wrote a book um, about her son, a children's book, and he his disability, he, he has muscular dystrophy. Mm -hmm. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yeah. So um, that that's what the book was about. A little boy who um, is dealing with that and living with that. Um, and I, I always find it, you know, interesting how we write about fiction, but certain um, aspects of our lives, like illness, like something that is very real, real right, um, mm -hmm. are often left out of our books. But mm -hmm. um, with Aniana, it's it's we're learning quite a bit, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we definitely appreciate all that information. Um, when you mention you have expressed in the past that you um, you made Aniana braver than you are in real life. Why do you why do you say that? I think uh, yeah, I mean she is able to um, ask for what she wants and she's able to kind of have this um, bodily autonomy and say, no, this is my body and I think you know yes, you're my parents and these are my doctors, but I would like, to have these conversations about what we're going to do with my body together, rather than people just imposing their will, um, you know, on, onto her and to her body as, as a young person. And um, Aniana sort of learns this within the first year, right, of diagnosis and symptoms and all of that. Um, whereas for me, it took at least almost a decade for me to finally be like, especially standing up to my doctors, I think, to really say like, no, like, no, you're not going to cut me open. No, you're not going to do X, Y, and Z procedure because this is my body and I have a say. And I felt like Anyana sort of spoke up in a way um, more quickly and, and sort of with more certainty than, than, than I did when I was first diagnosed. Um, and I think that she, she's not necessarily brave because like, oh, she's like enduring this thing, right? But like, but that she finds the way to, to talk uh, about what she wants and what she needs for herself. In, in ways that took me a long time uh, to kind of find the strength and, and the language for. Um, Cause you know, I was just kind of like, I was diagnosed at 22. So I was still technically, like I still felt like a child in many ways. Like I was, I was still a young person. Um, and so my parents were very involved in when I was first diagnosed and they wanted to know all the questions. And they, you know, my dad was telling me like, Can you it? Don't do this, go here and do that, you know, and trying to, and I was like, okay. Cause you don't know, you're just, it's like, it's all new territory for you. And so you're just trying to find an answer. You're trying to find anything that's going to help you kind of manage what you're going through. And I think that, um, that even from like kind of the beginning, Aniana has felt this desire to like speak up. She just doesn't know how. Whereas for me, I was like incredibly passive. I was like, I will do whatever anybody says. I don't care. I just want to feel better. Um, but Aniana is like always resistant to that. Like she's still, she has her own bodily autonomy. She just doesn't, isn't quite able to like express that yet, right? To like find the strength to like say it. Um, and I didn't even have that. I was just like, just make it go away, <laughs> you know? Which is totally understandable on both on both ends. Um, yeah, yeah. Especially when you're confused about, you know, a diagnosis and you mm -hmm. just, and in your, if you're in pain, you definitely want to feel better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think that I would have probably behaved the same way. I hate surgery, don't. <laughs> You know, I would have been like, busquen otro remedio. No hay un remedio por ahí. No hay jarabe, que me da. No hay un jarabe, un té, que no se puede beber. That would have, that would have been me. Um, so while writing this book, there were there any re revelations you came across or anything new that you learned besides the, um, about um, JIA? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I'm a, I, I learned how to create shape poems and I'm pretty sure the book designers hate me <laughs> because it was just- So was, was that intentional? Did, yeah. did you just have this idea to say, oh, I want this poem to look like this mm -hmm. or did you go out there and look for something, you know, different to include in the book? No, yeah, I um, having taught third and fourth grade creative writing um, and shape poems, concrete poems being kind of a staple of one of those things that, that I would teach kids how to do and knowing that they like loved it, like the fourth, fifth, they're good, even sixth graders, like really like kids who don't like poetry, they see a shape poem and they're like, I want to try that. Like, I want to make 
pictures right. with words. And so it kind of started, it literally, I think it started with the sea turtle poem. And then I kind of got like addicted and was like, I'm going to put these wherever I can. Um, and, so and how many and, of those are in the book? Oh my goodness. We scaled. So, we, yeah, I think I scaled back question, a little bit. My next question is yeah. how, how, how much of a hard time did you give these designers? <laughs> Were you looking Listen, they, at it constantly and say, that doesn't look right. That doesn't look like a turtle yet. <laughs> Actually, they did a great job. I'm not going to lie. They, the okay. first, on the first pass that I saw the images, I was like, no, these look great. Um, I had actually had no issues. Well, the issue was like, it started, like we started the drafts in one format and then switched them to PDFs and then things got kind of wonky. And I was like, wait, I got to like adjust them on my end. But in the end, like they did a great job creating those shapes. Like I just kind of gave up and just gave them the block of text and said, this should look like a heart. Figure this should out. look like a turtle. <laughs> Make it work, you know? So there was that. Um, yeah, there's a, I would say maybe there's like, like, like eight or 10. Um, Cause there's also some of the, some of the poems also look like waves. Those are probably the more difficult ones actually, because the tab spaces kept getting off. And then when we switched from an eight by 10 page to like the mm -hmm. size of this That's book, like everything started yeah shifting and I was like where is this? like what happened to this poem so that right. was that um and, and the other thing that I, I'll just mention real quickly that I did I learned a lot of interesting facts about Galveston Island um while I was doing the research um I learned a lot about Hurricane George which uh, hasn't is talked about in the book a little bit as I was doing research on different hurricanes in the DR um because you know I when you're writing a book you can go down these rabbit research holes that don't end up in the book but that inform the book in yeah. some way <laughs> and so so I did I did do some of that oh and the Coast Guard I learned things about the Coast Guard because Ani's father is in the Coast Guard my dad was in the in the U.S. Army and her dad is in the Coast Guard and so I had to make sure to depict that experience of being you know a Coast Guard a, a, a coastie that's that's a word I learned you're a coastie when you're in the Coast Guard um, right. and I actually spoke to some Coast Guard um, students that they were in the like Coast Guard Academy I think is, is what it's called um, so that was kind of cool as well Nice. I love that. I love that. What do you hope readers get out of reading Aniana mm -hmm. about Aniana's journey? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I hope that they, a couple of things, I hope that they begin to empathize and realize that disability and illness doesn't look one way, um, that there are different ways to be disabled, that there are invisible illnesses and invisible disabilities, and you never really know what anyone is going through. Um, they can look strong, right, and healthy, um, and, and normal. Those are all words that I like cringe at now. Um, but that doesn't mean, right, that, that other things are happening in their body, right? And we, and we should be, yeah, kind and just, and just uh, compassionate in those ways. Um, and I also hope that, that they, you know, that if there is something that they want to do for themselves, that they have a dream, if they have a goal, something they're passionate about, um, that that they know that there are ways to accomplish that, right? Um, even if you are diagnosed with something, even if your body, you know, now has certain limitations, um, and and that you can you can find ways um, to 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 do what you love or find something new that maybe you love even more, because that's sort of my story, like Ani has her swimming and, and, and she sticks with the water. But for me, right, like illness took, you know, theater away from me in many ways. Um, I've been able to come back to it, but in different ways as a playwright versus an actress, right? right? And so what are the ways in which we can still connect with the things that we love, um, you know, kind of maybe regardless of what's happening with, with, with our bodies um, and sort of, um, yeah, be resilient, but also not just resilient, be mindful, right? And, and give ourselves grace and rest when we need to, because Ani acknowledges, like, I, I have my good days and bad days still, like at the end, it's not a perfect little bow that she's healed and she's better, but that, you know, it's a thing that she's going to have to manage for the rest of her life um, and, and find ways to, to live with and accept. Um, and that I think, you know, we, we can accept that we can accept that things have changed, right? There's also the serenity prayer that comes up uh, in the book a couple of times. Um, and so I hope that that, yeah, that they empathize and that they learn a little bit about um, this, this illness and become curious um, to, to, to learn more. Um, and again, show compassion to, to others um, with disabilities and illnesses. Wonderful. Um, are, we, are we to expect a part two of um, Aniana jumps in? I don't think so, but I have learned never to say never. 
Um, you know, if this book like pops off and people are like, we want more, you know, I never say never to things anymore because I, I said, some of you may recall in my, my Twitter, when I was uh, always on Twitter, I was like, I don't want to write a novel in verse. And I was real chiflada about it. As the Mexicans say, real mancriada. I was like, no, that's not me. I don't want to write a novel in verse. And then here we are yeah, three years later. <laughs> 380 pages later, and I have a whole novel in verse uh, and writing another one. So, you know, never say never. I leave the door open. Vamos a ver. Vamos a ver. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. One last question. So I'm sure we have plenty of folks here who want to know about school visits. Sure, Is yes. Jasmine available for school visits? Yes, Jasmine is available for school visits in person and virtual. Um, in person, if it's out of Houston, you have to fly me there or give me a bus ticket or something. Um, but uh, yes, virtual and in person. And I, I would love to come talk to your students. So please hit me up. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. So here, let's see. Some We're going to go into the Q&A now, folks. If you have a question for Jasmine, hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and um, let us know what your question is. We're going to go through them one by one. So um, someone says, can part two be where Annie gets a Mexican novio? You see, no, Lupe, <laughs> Lupe no. who write a, a, a cat, wants you to write a character inspired by him. <laughs> I'm going to say, Lupe, you can go write some fan fiction about Aniana if you would like and give her a novio. So. <laughs> Lupe, you can write your own novel in verse. That's what I said. I, mean, what I, I, always, I always tell him, I think he's a little a little salty because I got the jump on using Galveston as a setting and Galveston uh, is, uh, is where he was born. And so he's like, why wow, you got to use my hometown? <laughs> So let's see, what are the questions that we have here? So um, we already went through Lupe's fun facts. Um, Kimberly asks, um, if it was difficult for you to publish. Um, so I'll speak in general. Um, you know, I, I've been at this for a long time. Um, I know kind of based on social media and things like that, it looks like, oh, overnight, she's got 17 books. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> that's a huge exaggeration, but no, I, I have been, I have been at this for, for, for a very long time. My first publication was in an anthology in 2007. Um, and that one, um, it says not to downplay it, but it was like by happenstance because I was taking a, a memoir, um, class and the professor was putting together an anthology and she's like, I love your memoir. I'd love to include it in the anthology. And I was like, okay. Um, cause I really had no intentions of publishing, um, at that time. I thought that slam poetry, spoken word, performing only on stage was what I was going to do the rest of my life. Because at that point I was like, literature is dead. Nobody reads books. Why do I want to just, you know, put words on paper and then it sits on a coffee table somewhere. Even though I was an English lit major, I was obsessed with, with reading myself. Um, but a lot of the big bookstore, a lot of the small and big bookstores were closing down. People were going to e-readers at that time. And so I was like, literature is dying. Nobody's reading books. I don't want to publish. And then, yo, I saw my name in print. I was, I was addicted. <laughs> oh my God. I was like, what? My words on a piece of paper in a book that people could read forever. Um, and so from there, I kind of really, I got the bug, um, and, and slowly started putting stuff out there in small journals in lit mags. And also a lot of rejections. I opened myself up to a lot of rejections over the years. Um, and then um, really because of my book with Arte Publico, Night Blooming Jasmine, I kind of, after I had Luce and was reading picture books to her, I, I got the bug of like, I want to like, I would see how excited she would get about certain books. And I'm like, I want to write something that she can, you know, light up about. Um, and so I reached out to, to Marina at Arte Publico and was like, hey, um, I've got this book idea y'all want it? Um, and I said, well, I actually sent her like four or five and she was like, no, no, no. Yes. <laughs> and so, um, so I will say that it's, it, all of it is a process, um, regardless of, of, of how many or how much you publish, like there's also going to be a lot of rejections and a lot of no's that you're going to get before you get that one. Yes. That will change your life. Um, because I really do feel like this, this is one of those that, that, um, has kind of catapulted me in, in a different way as a writer because um, I've mostly been published by indie presses and university presses 
Um, and this is, you know, dial with penguin. So it's kind of like a big deal. Uh, they're all a big deal. And I'm very proud of all of them, of course. Um, I just, you know, I, I know that there's like a slightly farther reach in this case. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely say prepare yourself and just kind of acknowledge that there is going to be a lot of no's um, before getting that yes. And, and all it takes is that one yes, though. All it takes is the one. Um, so, so keep at it. Thank you. So Judy is sharing that um, our Dominican elders are so stubborn with therapy. So happy that you're including this topic. Have your parents read Aniana yet? And what's been their feedback? Well, they just got copies because my parents live in the DR. My mom just came in recently um, and I handed her the hardback and she's so excited. So she started reading it. They haven't finished that I know of. Um, yeah, my mom just started reading it. So, so they haven't given me feedback yet. I'm sure my father will when he reads it because he always has an opinion. <laughs> uh, but it's usually always very positive, very good. Um, sometimes he does say though, like, why don't you write something joyful that'll be made into a movie and like they're all just like waiting for things to be made into a movie and I'm just like okay where's the money Jasmine where's, <laughs> where's the money maker they're just like when you're you get on Netflix, <laughs> it's just like it's not how it works y'all that is not how it works <laughs> or they're like why why hasn't Jorge Ramos interviewed you yet and I'm like <laughs> because I live right. in Houston why are you not on the America <laughs> what's going on <laughs> they expect you to just you know um, so no, so yeah, and, and that the therapy uh, inclusion came a little bit later as well, um, after edits and revisions and questions and thinking again, in what ways can we create uh, like a story that that feels like again, right? That like that that looks for that that healing in that relationship um, rather than kind of perpetuating that the same like tropes and, and stereotypes and things that that we are living. Um, and I will say that over the last decade, my mom herself has actually opened up a lot more to therapy. Not really for herself, which is fine, um, but she 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 uses it as a, as like, she's like, I think that person probably should go to therapy. You know, she talked to her, we talk about, you know, those those kinds of things and, and having someone um, to, to help you through those sort of emotional um, hardships. Definitely important. So Yvette Tineo shared that her teenage niece was diagnosed with JRA at five years old, and she's not sure if she dealt with the pain and in injections at such a young age. She was strong, brave, and as you said, normal as a teenage American, Dominican, Puerto Rican, and Italian girl. Do you think this would be a good read for her? I do think so. I mean, whether or not she, again, like I said, experienced the same exact things as Aniana, because it does affect different people in different ways and at different stages in their life. Um, I think that there are things that will probably resonate with her. Um, and, and I think that any, any young person, whether they have a disability or an illness or not, I think they will see something about themselves in Aniana, right? Whether it's her passion for her sport, her connection with Maria Teresa and that close friendship that they share, um, eating takis and jumping on the bed and painting their nails, right? Sort of those those um, common everyday universal kind of middle grade experiences um, that that she has. I think a, a lot of students um, and young folks will will identify with. Um, and and yeah, and and whether um, whether she had injections or takes pills, like Ani takes pills, and she's like, oh, this makes me feel horrible. Um, I think there's 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 lots of little moments like that that I think um, will resonate for sure. Thank you. Stephen Mills asks, since you have written poetry, both for adults and young people, could you talk a bit about how that experience the first from how that's been for you? Yeah, thank you, Stephen. I typically, so it's been a lot more fun. Uh, <laughs> I've had a much more uh, enjoyable experience writing poetry for young people. Um, than adults. I mean, I, I enjoy, I think that, that writing poetry for adults um, requires a certain like, like intellectual arena that, that I put a lot of pressure on for myself um, that I feel like, well, it doesn't sound like so-and-so's work or is this academic or not? Or are these images like unique enough? And I think for children, I give myself the freedom to really just play with language and I can really lean in on sort of my uh, my crutches, which are alliteration and repetition, um, because I feel like kids really love that. <laughs> and so I can really kind of uh, kind of play with language in that way um, and sort of not kind of be hesitant to, to lean into that um, in the ways that sometimes I do with, with kind of like my poetry for adults. Um, 
And, and again, and so, and I always, I, I'm always weary of like trying to separate the two because I feel like people think like writing poetry or writing for children is like less than or requires less craft. And it doesn't because to be able to craft a, a young voice when I'm 38, to be able to sound like a 12 year old um, or a 13 year old um, and find the language um, that, that speaks to and creates that voice is a challenge. And so it's sort of a different a different um, sort of part of uh, my creative brain that I have to kind of employ in there. Um, but I, I just, I, you know, like writing the shape poems was incredibly fun and exciting to, to play with. Um, using the alliteration and the repetition was a lot of fun um, because I feel like sometimes when I write poetry for adults, I have to like not do those things to make it sound different or grown or academic or ready to publish, you know, in poetry magazine or something like that. Um, and for this, I'm like, kids want a story and they want fun language and they, you know, I want to expose them to these different poetic ideas um, in a way that's accessible to them. Um, but it, it has, it definitely has its own challenges because there were, there were times where I had words or ideas that I wanted to use that I was like, this isn't going to resonate with young readers. Like, why am I saying it like this? Like, what is a way that I can say it that is accessible to them? Um, and so that your word choice um, is, I think, has to be even, even more deliberate. Um, perhaps than, than when you're writing for adults, um, to be able to craft that, that believable, authentic kind of young voice, if you will. Thank you for sharing that. And here we have Francesca. Hi, Francesca. Francesca is the author of High Spirits. And her question is, do you ever get stuck with your writing? And if so, how do you deal with it, especially if you're on a deadline? Yeah, great question. I'm on deadline right now. <laughs> um, I would say that um, I see my writing um, as, as, as a muscle and, and I engage in a lot of um, rituals that kind of help spark that creativity in many ways, right? Just like the, sometimes you have rituals before you go to bed that tell your brain it's time to sleep. I have a set of rituals that tell my brain, oh, it's time to be creative. Granted, it doesn't always work. <laughs> so I'm just, just caveat there. Um, but right, like I kind of engage in these pre-writing rituals that help my, my body get into the zone. That, and that involves all of the senses. Like there's incense and candles. I lotion my hands. I listen to a little Headspace podcast. I meditate. I do a little yoga. Uh, sometimes I read um, just to kind of get you know excited, like to kind of get language flowing. Like I'll read a poem or I'll pick a book off the shelf and open to a page um, and, and, and read it. Um, I also, even on deadline, I give myself breaks. Like I pop, like I rest, like I believe in resting rituals um, uh, to, to just kind of refill that cup. Um, and yeah, that's the other art. I refill my cup by looking at other artwork. Um, I'll look at visual art. I'll watch indie films. I will, um, I look at, I, I engage in nature. Nature to me is, is, is art, right? And so I, I try to pay more attention to nature, just take a nature walk um, or go to a park, sit by the water. Um, all of those things help me kind of refill um, and spark um, that creativity. Sometimes I also think that some of those blockages are because I'm dealing with, I'm not dealing with something on an emotional level. And so then I'm like, okay, do I need to cry? Like I need to find, I need a good cry right now. Right. Or, or I need to get angry at something like, and how do I release whatever blockages, um, are happening to me emotionally so that I can get to that creative space. Thank you, Francesca, my apologies <laughs> on the title of your book, which is what's coming to me. Um, everyone could purchase it on Word Up, yes. online yes. and in person in the bookstore. It appears we don't have any more questions. We did answer the question about the school visits. Um, yes, you can go on my website and there's info there. Yeah, you can also talk to. Do we have any more questions from folks? Mm -hmm. Or are we good? So just a reminder to everyone, if you haven't purchased a copy of Aniana, um, then Mad jumps in, please do so. You could purchase it at Word Up Bookstore in person or, or via the website. They will ship to you. If not, purchase the book at your local retailer, especially if it's an indie bookstore. Go support an indie bookstore and purchase the mm -hmm. book from them. Idalmi shared in the chat that um, congratulations on publishing this book. I will share with my sister who's a teacher so that she can share it with her students. Um, she did share any advice for writers, words of inspiration or encouragement. 
Yeah, I will end, you know, with A, allow the time that it takes. So I know we all feel like our work is ready and urgent and needs to be published yesterday, um, but the page will be there when you're ready. So take the time that you need to take to write the story that you want to write. Um, and if you have a desire to tell a story, to tell your story, then you need to tell it because if you don't, someone else will and they were going to get it wrong. Um, so just just write, write, write what you can, when you can. I don't believe in writing every day, that's ableist. Um, but definitely um, tell it your story, um, you know, if, if you have it in your heart to do so. Um, and yes, rest, writing, rituals, and refill your cup. So thank nice. you. Nice, I love those. We gotta put those on a t-shirt. <laughs> on a t-shirt. <laughs> Judy says, thank felicidades, Jasmine. I'm waiting on my pre-order copy and can't wait to read it. Thanks for sharing your talent Thanks. edward paulino shared that he's very proud of you hi, hi eddie hi. how are you um and yeah thank you folks thank you for joining us tonight um we really okay. appreciate you celebrating aniana del mar jumps in with jasmine please share it with as many people as you know and many educators if you have a preteen in your life they don't need to be going through a disability or anything like that just you know, share the love of reading Dominican yeah. books. Because I'm going to put that in there. <laughs> share the love yeah. of reading Dominican books with your yeah. with your loved ones. Yes. Awesome. Yes, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure, Andy. I can't okay. wait. I'm going to be out in New York soon. I'm going to figure out a way and I'm going to be there. So, <laughs> Well, let us know. Kimberly mm -hmm. wants to know um, an email where she can reach out to you for the school visits. Yes, I'm putting it in the chat, bookjasminemendez at gmail.com. Yes, book Jasmine Mendez. Yeah, with two there N's and an E. Yes, yes, you can. Please do. Oh, I think right. you're muted. There you go. Oh, thank you both so much for this wonderful conversation. Those were great questions, Angie, and those were great answers, Jasmine. <laughs> I'm really excited to review everything too and watch this again and share it with people. Um, and I hope everybody will buy all of Jasmine's books and you it's can a lot, them. but you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also check out our other events where, you know, you can follow us at word up books. Uh, you can follow at Dominican writers and, um, Jasmine has dropped, um, the email book, Jasmine, B O O K J A S M I N N E M E N D E Z at gmail.com in the chat. And um, hope everybody has a good evening and we'll see you all soon. Thank you, Veronica. Yeah. Thank you, Word Up. Thank you, Jasmine. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.